Raphael Hershey from uh, the University of Kiel will be presenting. Sustainable HPC, what we can do. Okay. Please ask me questions. Okay. If you don't, I don't have a slide on Kiel. Kiel is not Kiel in Germany. Always Kiel is usually the question. It's in between uh, Manchester and Birmingham. Come and visit me uh, if you don't know, if you've not, never been. So, I'll talk about energy generation, various aspects of sustainability, and I'll talk a little bit about some case studies about reducing consumption either from the software side or hardware side. I'll start with the 5R. You're all familiar with five ways, maybe, to reduce our footprint, carbon footprint. But the question about this is, is it really applicable to HPC? When I think of the HPC, I just want more power, higher performance. But it's not my first thought of thinking of uh, energy footprint, although obviously as it grows in size, it's becoming more and more important, and anything we do for sustainability is important anyway. So sometimes I actually conflict it, because my, in my own research, I recreate stars on computers. My target is to have a billion computing hours to recreate my favorite stars, uh, but I am conflicted, because a billion computing hours is going to use a lot of energy, and I have a large CO2 footprint, so to compensate, I try to do some research on sustainability. Uh, and then there's always the question of what is sustainable, what is renewable. So re renewable is basically having something that can be replenished, where sustainable is trying to go a bit further. We don't want any uh, nefas or pollutant hazards and injustice. But the reality is no source is risk-free or waste-free. You can think I'm going to go through a list of renewable energy sources on the next slide. Nothing is waste-free, uh, waste-free, uh, waste risk-free. I'll give you an example. So we'll, probably if you think of renewable energy sources, you think of the items on this list. And I'll, I'll try to list the pros and cons, and also the power per unit. So for example, solar is a solar panel, which is quite small. That makes it uh, very small, but also very cheap to, to set up and install, and you can scale it up. Wind is also, let's say, cheap-ish compared to the others. Uh, but on the other hand, you have the, I'll, I'll go through some details about the, the negatives of solar and wind. Hydro, which you might think is the cleanest source of energy. Well, actually, in Switzerland, there's a 10-minute ev evacuation plan in one entire valley. Because if the dam breaks at the top of the mountain, the valley will be flooded in 10 minutes. Everything will be erased and washed away. And there are regular uh, dam breaks in different parts of the world, making a lot of damages. So nothing is risk or waste-free. That's the reality. Uh, I put fission question mark. I'm uh, pro-nuclear power. At least the CO2 uh, footprint is not there. If we look after the waste properly, it's, it's, I think it's uh, acceptable. And if we look at the scale of power per unit, it's a massive uh, supply of energy. I don't think we can uh, continue our lifestyle without nuclear power. There's a question mark next to fusion. It's not a question whether it's a good source. It's whether we'll make it uh, commercially viable uh, and when rather than if, hopefully soon. But that one joke is always a few decades away. Um, I have quite a lot of hope because commercial uh, entities are putting more and more funding and investing in fusion power, which is usually a sign that things start to move when commercial uh, companies start to invest in it. But an example of the ITER project in France is half a gigawatt. So that's also a good number uh, to remember. And then my, uh, I, I like to be able to convert easily between units, and kilowatt hours is probably one of the worst units that we can think of. But if you think of a kilowatt power source, and you run it over a whole year, then you have roughly uh, 10 megawatt hours in, in a year. So that's my conversion scale. So if probably in, in data centers, you're of the order of a megawatt. So you consume 10 gigawatt hours uh, over a year. OK, uh, <coughs> then I would like to compare this to the world energy consumption. So the world yearly energy uh, consumption is 100, it's maybe easier to remember, 6 times 10 to the 20 joule, then you have to convert it. It's 167,000 terawatt hours per year. So if I convert it back to t uh, watt, it's 20 terawatt. If I think of what fraction of that energy is in the form of electricity, we get 
and out of this 15%, we have 30% that is uh, produced from renewable sources. And this is the, the, the life and the time scale uh, variation in terms of renewable electricity generation. What is kind of quite encouraging is to see the, the quick, fast growth. Hydropower has been here for a long time, it's kind of plateaued. But if you see wind and solar, you have a huge investment in wind and solar um, sites. So there's a lot of hope, and HPC uses electricity, which is the main form for renewable energy, um, uh, energy type. So I would say it's possibly one of the easiest things to power with renewable, renewable energy sources. Uh, I just thought people in the room might know the predictions better than me. I just thought, well, what I was, is going to be the footprint, energy footprint of AI and HPC going forward? And you can see the first thing is estimates vary drastically. Uh, but then I thought, how does this compare to current energy usage? And my conversion, correct me if I, if I made some mistakes along, along the way, is roughly 10% of electricity usage could be due to uh, HPC or AI going forward. So this is a massive uh, fraction, very significant. However, as I said at the start, 15% of our energy usage is electricity. The rest, a bulk of it is transport. And therefore, uh, the predictions that EV, electric vehicles or cars will uh, have a much higher energy footprint than HPC still. So that and EVs or cars are roughly 20 to 40% of the total energy, not just total electricity, total energy. So significant footprint, but not as large uh, as cars. Okay, so now, uh, as I said, various aspects of sustainable HPC. Let's look at uh, energy generation. And I, I mentioned already solar power as one of the main uh, renewable energy sources. The, the, the negative aspect is uh, strong daily and seasonal variations. So, so this is just a plug-in. I have solar panels. I'm very proud of my solar panels at home. And uh, this, this is my yearly production of, uh, this is for last year. And you can see a strong seasonal variation. You produce a lot in the summer, close to nothing uh, in the winter. Although this is obviously country dependent, so that could be, would be much better in different parts of the world. And this is a, a, a year hourly average for certain dates. Uh, so in the summer it looks quite good, but the other point is there are a lot of uh, short-term variations. I think that's uh, the point I'm trying to make here is a battery system maybe is uh, not explored enough in the context of HPC and renewable energy because the batteries can act both as a backup in terms of power failures for HPCs but also as a buffer if we consider energy, uh, renewable energy sources. Well, otherwise, the, the ballpark figure is if you think that there are 400 watt per unit, you're gonna, if you want to power a large HPC system, you're going to need thousands of solar panels, so you need quite a lot of space, and maybe not exactly where the center is, depending on the weather forecast of your system. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, Skill, what we are doing at Kiel, and this is uh, our new, uh, this is, my work is part of a new institute called the Digital Society Institute. We have a, a brand new building with several facilities. We have a, a small data center for people in the room that's like a, a toy. But it's, it's a, it's, as I will tell you, it's an interesting uh, mix of uh, architecture. And we have a conference and, and workshop facility. So as I said, if you've never been to Kiel, please come and visit me. I can host your next events. If you're in. So maybe I should say uh, seventh annual meeting will take place in Kiel, maybe, or the eighth or the ninth. I'll talk to Mark later and Brian. Okay, so the, the, we have a new cluster called Green HPC. It's called Green HPC because it's uh, green energy powered and powering green energy research. It's very small. It's like about 10 nodes. But I'm quite happy with how we uh, set it up in terms of architecture choices. So we have some traditional CPUs that are actually Intel uh, chips. But we have one node with H100 cards, which were very hard to get. So I'm very proud we managed to get H100 cards at the time. And the rest are uh, Lovelace 40 cards. And the design is the H100 is double precision. Lovelace is uh, single precision. So for, we try to see in terms of mixed mode uh, for users to have the, the most efficient and cost-efficient systems. This is what it looks like. I think the problem with HPC, you can never get pretty pictures. It's never going to look impressive when you have a, a small 
two cabinets, especially the, the, the size shrinks with time, so you have like all this impressive computing power in a very tiny amount of space, cramped up in a small room. Uh, uh, it's air-cooled, it's not, not by choice. We thought of using uh, water to heat up the showers for the sports center, but uh, it was too complicated. Okay, so the, as I said, green HPC is green energy powered, uh, so the, uh, we have a, a solar farm and wind turbines on our campus, so we have a, quite a large number of solar panels, we have 12,200 solar panels and two wind turbines. The solar panels have a kind of a peak capacity around 4 megawatts, and I have 12 solar panels on my roof, so I can compare easily, I just do a factor 1,000 between my roof and, and the system at Kiel. We also have two wind turbines, and wind, uh, wind is even more irregular than, than solar power, so it varies a lot with time, but I'll show you a, a minute advantage afterwards. The, the key thing to remember for uh, wind power is depends on the cube of the wind speed, so you really want a windy place, so that's why the UK is quite good for wind, strong winds, so you get a lot. So w these numbers really depend on the wind speed, right? So if you change the wind speed by a factor of two, these numbers change by a factor of eight. In general, ballpark figures for a wind turbine, so we have, as you see the ones at Kiel, the largest offshore wind turbines go up to 10 megawatts or 15 megawatts. Again, this is kind of like the advertised number for high wind speeds. Okay, so how much energy can we produce on our site? So again, this is energy in uh, megawatt hours. So uh, maybe it's not necessarily the best unit. What I want to show here are uh, seasonal variations. So I showed you my uh, yearly production at home. This is a function of months. So you see uh, the total in blue, solar in uh, orange. You see again in the winter, nothing much. In the summer, a lot. And then something went wrong in July. This is a maintenance or repair problem. That's why there's a big dip in July. But generally, you see the same bell shape for, for solar. If you look at wind, it's quite different. Actually, wind has more production in the middle of winter. So if, you, if I had to pick a, a, a renewable energy source for a data center in the UK, I would go for wind over solar, because it would provide me energy throughout the year. I would put it uh, somewhere offshore to have maximum wind speed. Okay, so wind is irregular, but better spread throughout the year. I think that's a great advantage of wind power. Well, obviously, if we're in the and near the equator would have the same solar energy production throughout the year, so then that solar would be better. But there is still the uh, time variation, so solar would still give you a lot during the day, nothing at night, whereas wind could give you energy throughout the 24-hour window. Okay, so uh, briefly about powering green energy research. This is uh, just uh, starting, but the question is what can we do? How can we use HPC to create like some things like digital twins, or uh, guide uh, research and development. In particular, we are looking at hydrogen uh, production, green hydrogen production. I won't have time to talk to about this, but uh, you can look at the project. In particular, this is a, a very basic example. If you take this uh, energy generation from the solar farm or the wind turbine, how much uh, green hydrogen can you produce uh, for a given month throughout the year? And the pattern looks exactly the same. Obviously, the units change now you're looking at kilos or tons of hydrogen that you could produce with the system. So for this is, uh, hydrogen is so, thought as a, for transport and also for, as a storage method for uh, renewable energy. Okay, I'm going to move on away from Kiel up to Durham, and Alastair kindly provided some information about uh, solar panels being installed in the north. So even in the north of England, you can produce uh, solar uh, power. And there's been a one million investment, so this is uh, through Iraq, I think, Iraq funding. So if you have spare cash and you can order solar power, solar panels is probably a good investment in the summer. Alistair said it covers 100% roughly of, of the consumption, winter nothing. Overall, it produces 7% of the energy consumption. So there's strong daily and yearly variations, so this is uh, as a function of year, only a few months in the data set. These are the strong daily variations. Uh, but we can do quite a lot as long as you're not required to like power directly the system. So it's a good uh, offset. All right, uh, second half, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, reducing consumption, or in other words, optimizing flops per joules. I have about five, six minutes left, right? I think I'm keeping track of time. 
Okay, so first I'll start with an example with our own code. So this is uh, free dynamics. I should have put a video. So my, my research is about recreating stars on computers. Uh, and uh, we use uh, Fortran. Uh, anyone still uses Fortran in the room? Am I the only one left? One? Okay. There are a few, yes. <laughs> Fortran still is very efficient. Well, C is as good, but uh, I'll, I'll have a line on Python at the end. Okay, uh, the, sorry, the quality is not as good, but you, what you need to know, this is our strong scaling, and uh, red, is, red curves are Cosma on, on CPU. Architecture will be clearer on this one. So uh, here we are rescaled, but strong scaling, so the time to uh, solution decreases as we increase the computing power. If we uh, just focus on the right-hand side, here we compare the number of Tursa GPUs, so these are A100 in, in Edinburgh, versus uh, 256 Cosma 8 CPU cores. These are AMD 7763 cores. And basically, we've moved the lines so that the performance is comparable. So what this graph shows us with the solid line being the actual uh, data points from the strong scaling test is that one GPU card achieves roughly the same work as 256 uh, AMD cores. So if we consider rough estimate for energy power, a100 being 300 watts uh, versus 280 watts for the AMD CPU, we can have uh, four times less power consumed for the same uh, CFD calculation. Now, Alastair commented, uh, what about the cost? So I'm not talking about the cost here. There's obviously various aspects, right? How much does it cost to purchase? How much does it cost to run, etc. But obviously the best improvement would be uh, cost-effective and energy-efficient uh, savings. Another uh, example uh, from uh, Edinburgh I, I took from uh, uh, Antonin Portelli in the context of DRAC was to uh, use the, the clocking speed. So Mark gave another example earlier from, from Leicester team. How does the energy efficiency in flops per joule compare when you uh, vary the, the GPU clock? And you can often find an uh, optimal point, which is not necessarily maximum speed. It's also not the minimum speed, which is interesting. So maybe this can be uh, adjusted. And they found, uh, so the simulation, so if you re only reduce the speed by 10%, so the, the performance by 10%, you can reduce the energy uh, consumption by a lot more. Then I thought, well, I talked about Kiel, so small systems, so I have to balance it with Frontier, the largest machine on, 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 on Earth. So I contacted Bronson Messer, who's also an Arsenal fan like me, so we can talk about football. Arsenal is doing really well this year, so I'm quite happy. Uh, and I think this, this is probably, for me, for me, the key plot. So they have the Jaguar, they had the Jaguar system, CPU only, so this is the table of their system with the system name and the ratio of CPU to GPUs. And you can see the, the power demand. Uh, <coughs> so this is megawatt per exaflop, okay? The scale here. So lower is better. But what you can see is not just the improvement from going from Jaguar. So I think we, we have to redo this plot with a log scale. But you have a factor 10 from Jaguar to Titan going from CPU to uh, GPU system. What I find quite surprising is the increase or the improvement in, in uh, performance, energy performance, from Titan to Summit, and then even from Summit to Frontier. There's another, more than a factor 10, even considering GPUs, so just from ge between generations of GPUs. And I think that this, is the, this uh, change in energy performance is the key to enable the larger system to be de deployed because of the energy uh, demand constraints. Okay, so I think this is a comparison between Summit and Frontier, and then you can see here that they, they had 150 petaflop per 10 megawatt on Summit, and they have one exaflop per 50, roughly the same power demand on Frontier. And this, these are for the next system. Their PUE, power usage efficiency also, is, is they're they are hoping to, to make it like one. Basically, the energy you provide is the energy, the useful energy in the system. Okay, and then uh, for them as well, obviously they had a hardware and software journey, so this is pillars of energy efficiency, and the journey towards exascale for them was mostly a hardware journey, improving the energy efficiency of the hardware, but they think that going forward the journey will be more on the software side and application side. 
So they have, it provided uh, me with a lot of examples of what uh, you could do, for example, mixed precision, all these other future ideas of how to minimize the energy footprint of a, an actual simulation. So just to conclude, so HPC, an electricity in general, is a good candidate to be produced from renewable energy sources. Solar and wind are probably the easiest candidate, but fusion hopefully will be ready soon for us. Then we can have uh, one gigawatt at our disposal, right? We just need a, a fusion power station next to our computer. Uh, batteries also should be investigated and can provide both a backup and a buffer to uh, to uh, HPC system. As I said, I talked about fusion. On the software side, I talked about our own code. Uh, but there are other examples like Python versus C. So if Fortran is uh, looked look badly at nowadays, Python is super inefficient, although most of Python is as a backend in C. But Python, I don't know if I talk about this, but this is a link I took from Alistair's website, uh, the, the Cosmodex the website, where C is much more efficient than Python. Okay, and then the last point is a give back option. So you, as a user, I think I should, there, and I, I think we've started discussing this with Alastair as well, the, the idea of giving back our time. We, we apply for time, a lot of time. I want a billion hours, remember? Uh, but maybe I won't be able to use the whole million, a billion. So maybe I, I have the option to give it back to somebody else if I'm not using it all the time in some quarters. So this give up option to, this is kind of like refuse or reduce in my in initial slide. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Raphael. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. Okay. Oh, fantastic talk. So, so I was wondering, you know, when you look at workloads on uh, AI workloads, could you also do a scheduling decision to change the way you schedule your workload to, ch to align with availability of energy? So, for example, you know, certain tasks may not be immediately relevant, so you could... Mm -hmm. So, have you considered that aspect of also changing the building energy aware scheduling? And not in my small uh, test bed system, but we had a, this, the, I think Paul alluded to it. So, the, the idea is if you make the system more efficient, you can have a smaller system that can uh, give higher priority to higher uh, urgent tasks or higher priority tasks. And I think that, that would also mean give a longer queue to less important tasks. And that can, uh, for example, uh, not just uh, like minimize the, the footprint of the entire system by having a longer queue for less important tasks, but also maybe if you look at the cost of uh, energy costs, but that's also related to the size of the system. So yeah, that, that's definitely something that can be done in terms of, but it should be like, okay, uh, if people are ready to pay more, or if the task is more important, giving it a shorter queue or the other way, the longer queue for less important tasks. Maybe, because then you could uh, really reduce your footprint. Uh, I don't remember being in one of these meetings before, but it's HPC meets AI in a way, and I'm surprised that we're still fragmented. And I bet when we hear from the Clifford Review, we'll still be asking that question. And I'm hoping we will be discussing these matters, not just talking about compartmentalized things. We all know, I think, although I don't believe you mentioned it, that in terms of AI, all the companies and their overwhelmingly commercial operations are trying to get data centers in play, which are in the gigawatt regime. That's three orders of magnitude more, literally almost, than Frontier is. And yet we're not talking about this. There's an environmental issue that's being created there. There's a moral, there's an ethical one about the value of doing these things and indeed why they should be separated off, as I fear we may learn from the UK, from HBC. Do you have a view on the difference? Are you talking about both? Please enlighten me on your views. I, I value your comment. I think I'm not the, a person with the power to make this decision. I started with uh, my second slide, which is uh, stating that I have more and more conflict views on my own energy and uh, HPC use, right? So we have, we have to be uh, critical at looking at ourselves. So I, I mostly look at myself so far. And uh, maybe there's a panel discussion after lunch. Maybe we can revisit that. I think AI and HPC have similar issues. And, and then that's also why I had the other slide about the, 
how you're going to provide that power because it's not just a, a footprint. It's actually how do you make it happen, right? You, you need a, a nuclear power station for the gigawatt systems. So I'm suggesting that AI is much more uh, consumptive and planning to be than HPC at this moment. I mean, there's only one industry that I can think that outperforms that, and that's crypto. Mm. Yeah. I think we should discuss it as a community. Okay, I think. We have time for another question? Okay. Bye. Thanks. Very interesting talk. I was interested in the, you talked about green hydrogen production. I've no sense of scale. Is that a lot of hydrogen or not very much? I think it really depends. Uh, okay. Because the, the, the question mark is uh, we produce, this is the amount we could produce if we use the, all the solar panels, all the wind energy to produce hydrogen. But actually most of that is actually going into uh, the, like a switching on light, heating in, on the campus. So uh, that is a significant amount, kilos. So I think order of kilos would be uh, powering a car for like a tank, it's maybe 10, 10 kilos. So this, this would be a lot of cars all the time. But most of that electricity is taken for the campus. So the, but my question and the, the research is, if you want to produce hydrogen, re replace petrol with hydrogen, then you, you'll need to, to provide the source of energy for that. And for, for me, it goes back to the question, which one is better between solar and wind? And if you want uh, hydrogen throughout the year, then I would mean, uh, build or purchase wind turbines to provide hydrogen throughout the year. That's kind of like, yeah, this is probably, I have to check the calculation, 100 cars, 1,000 cars continues. Okay. Thank you, Raphael. <laughs>